All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? So welcome back, everybody, to uh, ECS 240. So we'll sort of mostly pick back up from where we were last time, just one sort of administrative thing. I need to be out of town next Thursday, which means that we'll have to be sort of taping ahead. Uh, and we'll do that on Tuesday from 3.30 to 5. So you know, next Tuesday, basically, you get the, the fun of two EE 240 lectures. Uh, I realize this time slot that I have, which is 3.30 to 5, by the way, that'll be here. I realize that's the same time as EE 241. You know, I don't want to steal anybody from Bora, but uh, you know, I'm sure there's some of you guys who aren't taking 241. So for those of you guys who aren't, please do show up just so that you know I've got somebody to talk to and I'm not just kind of lecturing at the walls or anything like that. So by the way, who's, who thinks they could actually show up Tuesday, 3.30 to 5? Raise your hand. One, two, okay, that's, that's infinitely better than zero. So, uh, <laughs> so again, you know, if you can, please do show up. Uh, if not, you know, I understand, but uh, certainly make sure you do watch that because it'll be uh, critical in terms of material moving forward. So other than that, any kind of questions on either homework or material or anything like that that we've gone over so far? Everyone's done with the homework. It's completely clear. You know how to do everything. showed up to the uh, discussion session yesterday. OK, good. So hopefully at least you guys know how to do the homework, and maybe that'll uh, you know, percolate on to the rest of the class. OK, so unless there's any other questions, let's kind of just dive back in. Where we sort of basically ended up last time was we were starting to talk about, in some sense, models for the transistors. And in particular, we sort of talked about, in some sense, large signal models. But really, the, the kind of the point that we were starting to get at was that, unfortunately, life was sort of difficult. Because even though we had this nice square law model that I'm sure you guys have all you know, seen a bazillion <laughs> times now, there's all these, basically, things that we're doing differently with the transistors these days, essentially almost just to get them to work, A, and B, to kind of avoid a bunch of different effects that are happening. So what we started talking about was sort of what some of those effects actually were. Now, before we sort of dive back into that, Oh, we had our tunneling thing. Before we dive back into that, I wanted to mention one thing that we kind of skipped over last time, which is to make life even worse, not only do we have sort of all these weird things going on with the transistors, but unfortunately, you know, if somebody claims that, you know, here's a model for a device and this is exactly the device you already always get, that's of course totally bogus, right? Because again, this is a manufacturing process. So every time you run this process, you're going to get slightly different parameters, right? You might get, let's say, a slightly different implant dose, or a slightly different oxide thickness, or you know, the width and the length aren't exactly correct, right? And of course, any one of those are each going to affect all kinds of device parameters. So things like the threshold voltage, the mobility, the oxide thickness, the, you know, the resistance you get, and so on and so on, right? So not only do we have all these sort of weird things happening, but actually if we claim that we just have one device that behaves a certain way, actually that one device when we fabricate it is going to have like all kinds of different behaviors when you really get it back, right? Now in SPICE, the way people handle this is the so-called corners. And what they mean by that is something sort of like the following. So they say, okay, well, if I have, let's say, a couple of parameters, let's say, I don't know, threshold voltage and, let's say, a channel length or something like that, right? So what you might get if you sort of just put dots on all the different devices that you ever would get back from the fab, you'll get some space that, let's say, looks something like this. And by the way, this is totally bogus, so you shouldn't you know, treat this as being reality, but something that, let's say, looks like this, right? Now, you as a circuit designer, you don't want to have to simulate with like 500 different models to see if the thing's going to work, right? So instead, what you typically will do is you pick off so-called kind of worst-case conditions, right? So you say something like, OK, and by the way, I guess I should say these are sort of the delta VTH and the delta L. You say, OK, well, if I want to find things that are really slow, and of course, slow is kind of referring to digital stuff, because again, that's sort of who drives the process. So if you want to find stuff that's really slow, you'd look in kind of like the corner where you have the highest threshold and the highest channel length. Right? And if you want to find stuff that's fast, you'd look in the corner that has the lowest threshold and the lowest channel length. So what, in fact, actually the fab will typically do is they give you a model, or they actually give you three models, 
And in fact, it's a little bit more than that, but we'll get into that in a second. They basically give you models that kind of capture the edges of where they think the transistors will end up being. Right? And the way they kind of quantify that, or the way they call that is, again, these so-called slow versus fast versus typical. Okay? And usually that's sort of split up into the NMOS and the PMOS separately. So you'll get, let's say, one corner, the so-called TT corner. That means like both the NMOS and the PMOS are typical. By the way, the first letter is always referring to the NMOS. The second is always referring to the PMOS. Okay? So TT, that's like both devices are typical. SS, both devices are slow. FF, both devices are fast. And just in case you think it doesn't exist, it does. You could get things like FS, meaning the NMOSes are fast and the PMOSes are slow, or SF, meaning the NMOSes are slow and the PMOSes are fast. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, you know that's that's already I don't even remember how many different combinations. That's about let's say five different combinations you could come up with, right? You actually will typically combine that with variations on temperature and the supply voltage as well. And again, really the point of doing that is so that you can kind of think about, okay, for my particular circuit, what's kind of the worst case condition? And then what you want to do is simulate the thing in that condition to make sure that it actually works, right? Now, clearly, this is kind of pessimistic, right? Because if you just go and say, okay, well, all the transistors are kind of at the worst spot they possibly could be in, you're being pessimistic in some way, shape, or form, right? The reason you still do this, though, is it's kind of one of the only tractable ways of actually trying to guarantee that your circuit works, right? Because again, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to simulate my circuit with 3,000 different models and then figure out what the heck any of that actually means, right? Uh, by the way, unfortunately, sometimes people will do that, but then there's usually a very specific question that they're trying to answer, right? In general, you know, looking at your circuit, you need to really think about it, and so. It's just that these models, even though, again, they're a little bit bogus and that they're pessimistic, it's the most tractable way to kind of convince yourself your circuit's actually going to function correctly. Okay? So just to kind of give you an example of what these corners are doing, here I'm just showing for this is not our model, this is an older model, what would happen in the different corners. So in slow, slow, typical, typical, fast, fast. If I just looked at the threshold voltage versus, let's say, channel length, of the, I think this is the PMOS and the NMOS device. Okay, so this one here is the PMOS, that one there is the NMOS, just in case you couldn't tell based on you know, the sign of the threshold, but that's what those two things are. Okay? Now, you'd like to think that when the fab goes and gives you sort of these corner models, they'd give you something sort of real, right? And they kind of give you something correlated with reality, but usually they're not truly real. Okay, they're not exactly the same as what's actually going to happen. Okay? So as an example here, if you look at these corners and you just actually you don't really have to stare at it all that hard, it's pretty clear that all the corner model is really doing here is saying, okay, in typical, typical, let's say I was supposed to get about whatever, 400 millivolts threshold. All this particular model did is said, okay, fine. In slow, slow, it's 100 millivolts higher. In fast, fast, it's 100 millivolts lower even though there was all kinds of weirdnesses that happened in the process to actually make this happen, the way they modeled this is just say, okay, screw it, it's just a shift, right? Not real, certainly not, you know, no reason why that should be exactly what happened, but that's kind of just how somebody put this model together, okay? Now there's actually sort of another sociological phenomenon or maybe economic phenomenon that happens here. So if your nominal threshold was, let's say, about 400 millivolts, Having it shift by 100 millivolts in either direction is a pretty darn big percentage variation, right? And for especially if something like threshold voltage, where as we'll see later, things are like exponentially sensitive to that, that's a really big change, right? So I would also kind of claim that probably that's larger than what's re what you're really going to get back from the fab. Now, if you're the fab, why is it that you would give the circuit designers models that are worse than reality? What's your motivation to do that? To, uh, you want to be in a safe limit so you can make more money. Okay, yeah, you're right. You want to be in a safe limit so you can make more money. What's like the problem you're worried about? So you know, what if you put it exactly at where you expect it to be? Then we will start complaining. Yeah. Right. So let's say that you know you as the fab person give the spec exactly where you think it's going to be, and you're slightly off. Right. 
And then just like you said, you as a circuit designer will come back. You gave me garbage silicon. It doesn't work. I'm not going to pay for it, right? So if you're a fab person, you margin. Right? You say, OK, well, you should be able to work with anything over this whole range, right? So then if it doesn't work, you say, no, no, that was your bad circuit. That's your fault. You know, I gave you good silicon. I'm within my spec, right? So that's exactly, obviously, why that happened. So you know, we won't be doing this too much in this class. But if you really want to build a chip, you really do need to think about these models. Okay, because, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on this some more in a little bit, but you have to use these models, not because necessarily that you, nest, you believe that that's exactly what's going to happen with the devices, but if you don't think about and don't sort of check what's going to happen in these different corners, then if you just use one of the corners, it's entirely possible that that particular corner has some bogus effect in it. And so if you don't move the transistors around a little bit to see that your circuit's actually robust, there's a really strong chance that your circuit actually will not work just because there was some other error in the model that you didn't think to sort of take into account, OK? So I, you know, the, the, kind of the whole point of this was just to kind of maybe convince you that, OK, modeling these things is a pain in the ass. So you probably aren't going to be sort of too successful in doing a hand model. And you know, we'll, we'll show that a little bit more later on. But on the other hand, you clearly don't want to just rely on the simulator to tell you everything about how the devices behave. Because again, if nothing else, you know, as a designer, the whole name of the game is just getting some intuition about the circuit. You know, you're here, you're you know, doing graduate studies, and hopefully not because you want to be a spice monkey later on. Right? And by spice monkey, I just mean somebody who you know, does, OK, I want to design my circuit, sweep L, sweep W, sweep VT, you know, whatever, and just pick a point. <laughs> right? That's not why we're here. Okay? Now, again, to be you know, not quite as mean, I should say, the problem is really that you need to sort of understand something because, again, doing these models is actually pretty hard, right? Even if the fab was going to give you exactly what they believed was really going to happen, these models have hundreds and hundreds of parameters and all kinds of weird nonlinear effects in them. So actually extracting those models, there's people that spend like PhDs just understanding better techniques to extract the model and get that closer to reality, okay? So again, what I'm going to sort of do briefly today that we'll wrap up with is, I just want to kind of give you a flavor for what are some of the most important effects. Not because I want you to be able to like sit there and calculate to the last digit of precision what each one of those things is going to do, but so that if you see some SPICE model and you just kind of get some of the IV curves and the device characteristics, if you see that thing, you kind of know what to expect, right? So that if something is missing, you can kind of say, oh, hmm, I wonder maybe they didn't include this particular effect, OK? So that's kind of why I'm going to spend a little bit of time now just talking about you know, these issues that are going to pop up, just so that you have somewhere to go back to to say, OK, well, the circuit is behaving this way for the following reason, or the model is bogus for the following reason. Okay. So we already started out with that, sort of talking about this halo doping thing last time. Again, the purpose of that was really to sort of control short channel effects. In other words, to make sure that the depletion region here wouldn't extend so far that the device just sort of punches through. And we talked about how that has an interesting effect on the threshold voltage versus channel length plot. But there's one other thing I just wanted to sort of briefly bring up, right? So, you know, if I'm a pure device guy, or maybe not pure device guy, but you know, if I'm just looking at IV curves, then I'd say, oh, this halo doping, which is kind of controlling the short channel stuff, that's the best thing since sliced bread. Right, because I can dope these things super heavily, and I can stop you know all these like nasty short channel stuff from happening. So by the way, what's the what's the penalty you pay if you do that? What's bad about this? Somebody said something. Say that again. Junction leakage. Ah, okay. okay. There is some junction leakage. You're right. Uh, that's probably not too bad, but you're right. I could I could get a problem with that. What's actually even you know usually more directly important to you as a circuit designer? You're decreasing the the uh, depletion region, you're increasing capacity. Bingo, right? So if I've got a really, really heavy doping in those two regions there, there's a really small depletion region, which means there's a lot of capacitance. Okay, so why do I mention this? Well, because someday you're going to get a model for, let's say, I don't know, a 32 or 20 nanometer device, and you'll look at its IV characteristic, and you know somebody will give you that model, and it'll do that. Right? Which, by the way, if you sort of have seen these things before, they really usually do something like that. Okay? So if you see something that does this, either obviously the model is bogus, 
Or you go back to your device buddies and say, really? Is this really what you meant to do? You know, what's the capacitance I'm going to get from this thing? Okay? Because there's always this trade-off between getting really nice short channel effects versus just having all that extra parasitic junction cap. Okay? Any questions on this? Or? Great. So let's go ahead and move on. So that was kind of the, the most interesting thing, so to speak, directly affecting the threshold voltage. We'll come back and talk some more about another effect in a second. But the next thing I wanted to talk about is sort of things that mess up your drain current. Okay? I mean, obviously, threshold voltage has an impact on that, but you know, other things that are going to mess up your drain current. Okay? So the first one, which hopefully many of you have seen already once before, is that when we do our sort of square law model, we always assume something like the velocity is equal to some <laughs> mobility times the electric field. Okay? And for a long time, that was basically true. Well, bad news is now, and actually for quite a while, probably about 10, 15 years or so, turns out silicon has a speed limit. Okay? It just has to do with if electrons are sort of flowing through all these silicon atoms, and the silicon atoms are vibrating around, if you try and go faster than sort of the speed at which they're vibrating, then just you know, the chance of you getting through anything without hitting a bazillion different atoms is basically zero. Okay? So long story short, there's a speed limit. Well, if there's a speed limit, what that means is that I can increase the electric field you know, kind of arbitrarily, and my carriers aren't going to go any faster than they used to. right? So just as a reminder, if we said that you know, current was all about charge times velocity, if I really hit this totally velocity-saturated limit, then unlike before where we said that you know, current, at least in the saturation, was VGS minus VT squared, and remember, you know, one of those VGS minus VTs came from charge, and the other one from velocity. Well, now if the velocity is fixed, sorry, don't get that benefit anymore, right? So now your current, at least in the limit, would be proportional just to VGS minus VTH, okay? Now, unfortunately, you know, in real life, you never sort of sit really all the way over there, but you sit sort of somewhere in the middle, right? And so as you move along basically the VGS space, you go from being not velocity saturated at all, meaning the device looking really like a long channel device, or really I should say a low electric field device, up to over here where you know that actually comes into the picture very substantially. Okay? So because of that, again, people have come up with all kinds of so-called hack models that try and take this into account. So like, you know, in the two limits, one is x squared and the other one is just linear. So like one of, uh, one of the favorite hack models is the so-called alpha model, where they say, okay, well, it's not x squared, it's not totally lim linear, so why don't I just make it somewhere in between? Like 1.3 or 1.4 or 1.2 or whatever the heck happens to fit my data, right? Obviously, no physical motivation other than just it's kind of somewhere in the right spot. But again, one of these sort of models that people will just come up with, and obviously for you as an analog designer, is not going to be particularly useful because for any given bias point, it's totally wrong. Okay. Now, usually when, again, people talk about sort of MOSFET current, we focus just on sort of you know, how much charge and the velocity of that charge, and we sort of believe the velocity is set only by kind of VDS in some way. Well, it turns out life is actually even more complicated than that. Because as you increase the gate voltage, you're actually applying more vertical field onto those carriers. And it turns out that's actually going to effectively slow down how fast they can really go. And the really simple analogy is, you know, if you were trying to run, and there's a really strong wind like pushing you into the wall. Well, A, it's painful, but B, it's hard to run fast, right? Because you just keep hitting the wall and you know you run into all the cracks or whatever it is on the wall and just you can't go that quickly. Okay? So the more sort of technical explanation for this, or the, the effect that people refer to here is so-called vertical field mobility degradation or reduction. Okay? And there's this not too bad, but slightly complicated expression that I've shown here. Bottom line, what it's really saying is just that you know, if you have a large vertical field, 
then your electrons or holes, as the case may be, as they're trying to get from the source to the drain, they get pulled up towards the surface and they basically bounce off of the surface, which slows them down. Okay? So you'd often see plots where if you looked at, let's say, let's say sort of a ID versus VG, you know, if it was supposed to be kind of completely linear, let's call that VG and ID, at some point it actually sort of starts rolling off a little bit. Just because, again, that vertical field gets so strong that you start actually not getting as much current as you were expecting, simply because the velocity goes down. Okay? Does this make sense to people? Or? Yeah? Are the thetas just arbitrary kind of constants, or are they angles? Oh, no, no, they're, they're constants. Um, they're numbers. So don't ask me why they chose theta. It's just it's some constants there. Okay. Um, I forget exactly what they range from, but you know, there's something like 0.5 to 1.5, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, in fact, by the way, this is even a simplification. There's actually some power law relationship there, but bottom line, you don't want to deal with it. Trust me, it's a pain in the ass. Okay, and we'll, we'll see how we're going to deal with that later. Okay, I mean, it's maybe not so bad. If you do this, you can actually come up with something halfway reasonable. But you know, as we'll see in a second, if we actually tried to use it for analog design, not going to work so well. Okay, so we'll see how we deal with that very soon, actually. Okay, so now the other thing, which is sort of the classic, what's really stupid about the square law model, is obviously if you put VGS exactly at the threshold voltage, the current doesn't just magically all the way go to zero, right? As I'm sure you guys all know, hopefully very well by now, what really happens is you always have some leakage current, right? And the source of that leakage current, again, should hopefully be sort of very obvious to everybody. So let's just draw our you know, transistor here. So I've got my source, I've got my drain. All right, I've got my gate here. Well, guess what? Anytime you have an NPN, that's also known as a bipolar junction transistor, right? So in reality, what you've actually got is something that looks like essentially this, where the base of that transistor is basically being controlled by the capacitive divider between the gate and the body or the substrate, right? So as you might expect, you know, if you put some voltage on the base of a bipolar transistor, you're going to get some current flowing through there. Right? And so just to be clear, if we sort of drew an equivalent model here, this would be our gate. This would be our depletion capacitance. That's obviously the oxide capacitance. That's going to connect to this BJT over here, where this is the so-called source. And that's the drain, right? So just you know, sort of maybe a reminder, hopefully everybody remembers this. If this is the case, then basically what we should expect to happen is in the subthreshold region, rather than getting zero current, we should get some current that kind of exponentially depends on the VGS, right? Because that VGS, through the capacitive divider, translates into the VBE of the bipolar junction transistor, right? So as you move that VBE around, current changes exponentially, OK? So again, I think this should hopefully be sort of review for most of you guys. So if I wanted to look at sort of what the voltage on that base is as a function of VGS, Again, really, it just has to do with that capacitive divider, right? So if I said, you know, if I'm going to move the gate to source voltage, and I want to see how much does that actually change the VBE, which, by the way, is just the voltage in the channel, it's really just set by that capacitive divider, which is exactly what you know that equation there is showing you. Okay. So usually, people like to think of this as a so-called non-ideality factor. Because obviously, if your VGS was directly controlling the VBE, then it would exactly be a bipolar junction transistor. But since it's kind of indirect, you have to actually swing on the gate more than you would have than, than you get on the, the base. It's kind of like there's this extra factor that you're paying in terms of how non-ideal is this as a BJT. Okay? So that non-ideality factor, all we did was just invert this thing over here. So this n is just 1 plus 
the depletion capacitance divided by the oxide capacitance, which of course you can expand to be you know, the relative epsilons and the oxide thickness versus the depletion and so on and so forth. But bottom line, what you basically get is something where this n is typically 1.3 to 1.4, okay? something in that ballpark. Now, obviously, it actually varies somewhat with the bias that you use, since the depletion region is going to change as you change the bias. But ballpark, this is a pretty reasonable number to remember. Okay? And we're going to use this actually a little bit later on today, so keep that number in mind. Okay? So just like we just said, you know, essentially we have a bipolar junction transistor, so if we want to know the leakage current of the MOSFET, we just take our bipolar junction transistor model, and we just plug that in, and that's basically what you get. By the way, I'm assuming everybody's seen this before, right? You know, raise your hand if you've seen VJTs at least once before. Okay, good. So I'm not going to spend any more time on it. This is just the BJT equation, just plugged into if I actually had a MOSFET. Again, the only thing that's a little bit tricky there is that this all happens right around the threshold voltage, right? So once you go beyond the threshold voltage, then obviously it starts looking a lot more like a MOSFET. But below the threshold, that's where you sort of have this BJT-like behavior. Okay? In fact, it's actually even slightly more complicated than that, but we'll come back to that in one second. Now, you may be wondering why did I actually spend a lot of time on this? Well, it turns out actually an analog working kind of in this region or maybe near this region which, by the way, is called weak inversion or subthreshold, is actually becoming more and more interesting these days. And it used to be the case that everyone would just say, well, forget it. I'm never going to work there because it's just it's really, really slow, right? Because if I want to get any amount of current out of it, you know, since I have such a small VGS, I'd have to have a really, really big device, right? Which would mean that I have a really big CGS, okay? So implying that the thing is slow. However, there's, again, as I said, it's becoming increasingly interesting because if I'm really interested in low power, then, as we're going to see in a second, it turns out that actually working in this region is basically the most efficient region I can work in from the standpoint of getting a lot of transconductance for a small amount of current. Okay? The other thing that's interesting is as we've been scaling, even if you're operating in weak inversion, you can actually get some pretty high speed transistors, you know, even into like the gigahertz kind of range. Okay? So that means if you know there's a fixed application you're looking at, it starts to actually make sense to go towards this region. Now, the bad news is that you know, for all of the complaints I had before about the MOSFET models, amplify those by a factor of 10, and those are the complaints I have about this region. Okay? Because basically, again, if you're a digital guy, this is really not where you want to be. Right? This is like the parasitic thing. And so, and by the way, since it's exponentially sensitive to a bunch of stuff, including threshold voltage and doping and etc., it's really hard to get that model right. Okay? So if you're gonna you know, work in that region, you know, sort of user beware. Okay, because models are really nasty, as we'll talk more about later. The matching between the devices is really bad. So there's gonna be places where you really don't want to be doing this. But Sometimes it turns out to actually be the right thing to do. Okay? Now, actually it turns out that life is even more interesting in some sense because I was kind of you know, maybe hinting that when you were below threshold, all that mattered was the BAT, and when you were above threshold, all that mattered was the MOSFET. Well, of course, that's also bogus. right? Because if you're somewhere near the threshold, then now both things actually matter. right? both the so-called diffusion current I get from the BJT and the drift current I actually get from the MOSFET, both of them are actually kind of important in that region. Okay? And if you kind of think about it, if I want to get sort of a reasonable trade-off between, let's say, good power efficiency, which we said was going to push us in that direction, versus high speed, which pushes you in that direction, turns out this region right here is often kind of almost exactly where you want to be. Okay? But the bad news is, if that's where you want to be, coming up with almost any equation at all to model that is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, and if you don't believe me, here's sort of one way that people have tried to do it, which is they said, OK, well, I know what the current is in the, low re in the weak inversion region, and I know what the current is maybe in the strong inversion region. 
So why don't I just try and come up with some model to like patch between the two, right? So I just do like a curve fit between the two and smooth it out and you know do it over all this fancy math you want to do. Okay, so if you do that, there's a model called the EKV model, which I've sort of shown here that does basically what I just said. But just maybe to drive the point home, how many of you guys would want to do a homework with this as your model of the transistor? Not many, right? Well, in fact, nobody, I should say. We don't have any gluttons for punishment, I guess. Yeah, I agree. You know, I wouldn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole either. Okay, I mean, there's some people who will claim you can do it, but not, I don't see how I can get a whole lot of intuition out of it. Okay? So probably not what you want to do. So we'll again, we're going to come back actually quite soon to see how we're going to deal with all these things in a reasonably easy way, but still actually do the designs that we want to do. Okay, but before we do that, since this is an amp, oh, yeah. How straightforward is it, or maybe not straightforward, is it to take a, a circuit that you've implemented as a BJT circuit and then just switch it over the same circuit but do it with weak inversion MOSFETs? Ah, it really depends. So as we'll talk about a little bit more later this lecture, um, MOSFETs, if, even if you use them in subthreshold, they're not as good as a BJT would have been. Right? If nothing else, simply because of that capacitive divider there. Right? Now, in fact, there's, again, all kinds of other actually sort of second-order effects that come into the picture that make life even worse than that. Now, there's another sort of interesting thing that you have to be a little bit careful about is, you know, in BJTs, there's the base current, right? Whereas in MOSFETs, at least ideally, there should be no gate current there, right? So some of the stuff you would do in a BJT, you're doing just to deal with that effect, right? Now, by the way, that's all, it's kind of interesting. That's not exactly true anymore, because if you remember, I mentioned, you know, if you don't believe in quantum mechanics, just go and measure a, a MOSFET these days and you'll actually get some leakage from the gate to either the source or the drain, just due to tunneling. But obviously, the, the sort of the physical effect of that, you know, I can increase this tunneling current all I want, has a squat to do with how much current I'm getting through the transistor, which is obviously not the same as a BJT. Uh, by the way, just in case you don't believe me that this tunneling thing is actually important, um, in a probably modern process, well, maybe not anymore since they have high K, but in like a 90 nanometer, let's say, Intel process, the amount of gate leakage current you would get was about 100 amps per centimeter squared. Okay? And I'm not off on any of the units there. So if you had, you know, a 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter chip that you just filled with transistors, there would be 100 amps of gate leakage. Okay? So, by the way, you know, your entire microprocessor is probably only about 100 watts. So that means that, you know, obviously you're not doing that, but you can get a lot of current flowing through there. It's actually a good question. Does that answer it? Or? Yeah. Okay. So great. essentially, you can't, you shouldn't really expect to be able to do that. Um, <laughs> you can, I mean, it depends what you're doing, obviously. So if it's something like highly non critical, you can kind of do it. But just like with anything else, you, know, you always got to pay attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. right? So you got to think carefully about okay, why was this circuit built that way in the first place? And what are the potential issues that I might run into in translating it over? Okay, so unless there's other questions on sort of the drain current, again, we'll come back to how we're actually going to deal with all this as designers. The last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was just, again, since this is an analog class, obviously you're also going to care about output resistance, right? So let's just sort of go through a little bit and see what are all the new fun things that are going to mess us up from an output resistance standpoint, okay? So the first one, which hopefully, again, should be sort of very clear or, or very obvious to everybody is, you know, we'd like to have these sort of perfect current source transistors, but obviously we get some slope over there. And the classic explanation for that was always channel length modulation. Okay, so again, just to sort of really quickly remind everybody, if I just draw my MOSFET over here, right, that's the body, of course. There's always some depletion region around the source and the drain. And let's assume the thing is in saturation, right? So in saturation, the charge profile maybe looks something like this, right? Well, so now if I go and I increase the drain to source voltage, so that's VDS, and let's say that's ground over there, right? If I pick that up, the depletion region on the drain side has to get wider, right? 
And so, of course, if I look at the charge profile over there, it kind of gets pushed in a little bit, right? It's kind of like the effective length got smaller, OK? So probably when you sort of first saw this so-called channel length modulation, you know, the model you were given was something like that the drain current was whatever the drain current used to be times something like 1 plus this lambda VDS parameter. Okay, and so just in case you were curious as to where that came from, what you're really doing is just saying, okay, if I want to figure out the effect of this, what I should really be doing is saying that the channel length gets smaller with voltage, right? So I just introduced this like delta parameter that relates the change in channel length with the increase in the drain to source voltage. So now as long as this was sort of small, right, meaning the change in length was small relative to the length itself, if you just do like a first order expansion of that, meaning first order Taylor expansion, then 1 over 1 minus x just becomes 1 plus x. Okay? So that's exactly how we got this form of 1 plus lambda VDS, because that term right there, that's essentially what lambda ended up being. Okay? And of course, it has the units of 1 over volts, because it's like a relative modifier on the current. Okay? So if you're wondering where lambda came from, that's where it came from. Okay? Um, of course, if life was this simple, I would be very happy. Yeah. It's not, right? So that's not the only thing that's going to mess up your output impedance. The other thing is this so-called drain-induced barrier lowering, or a lot of people just refer to that as dibble. Okay? So what dibble has to do with is it just, it's really actually quite simple. It's just saying that if you change the VDS of the device, the threshold voltage is actually going to go down. Okay? And again, the really simple way to see that, and we're going to be drawing a bunch of transistors, so you know, I apologize for, you know, you're going to keep doing this over and over, but you know, that's the easiest way to see it. Okay? So again, we've got our good old transistor. If we put some voltage on that drain over there, right? What's going to happen is, again, because of that depletion region there, I'm going to have some charge built up on the edge, right? Well, guess what? It's a capacitor, right? So you always have to mirror that charge somewhere. Well, so some of that charge is actually going to get mirrored close to the surface, right? So if I'm mirroring some of the charge that's up over here, you know, close to the surface, close to where all of my quote unquote action is happening in terms of creating the channel. What that basically means is that now I don't have to put as much charge onto the gate to actually get carriers to come up to the surface, right? Because some of the, you know, sort of fixed charge that was over there is already getting imaged by the drain, okay? So that's a long and involved way of saying that basically if you increase the drain voltage, it takes you less VGS to actually invert the channel, okay? Which again just really means that you know if I want to model this effect, I should be modeling it with something like this you know equation that I've shown here, where you say the threshold voltage is some nominal threshold voltage minus some you know scaling parameter that I've called eta here times the drain to source voltage. Does this make sense to everybody here? OK, good. So you might think that's kind of the end of the story. But of course, again, life is not that simple. There's even one more thing that may indeed come into the picture, especially if you're working on analog kinds of stuff. Okay. So, And by the way, there's a whole bunch of other phenomenon, but these are probably the three most important ones. So the last thing we're going to have to worry about is so-called SCBE. Okay, this is substrate current body effect. Uh, again, sort of fancy, fancy name, but it's actually for stand, you know, it's sort of dealing with a very simple phenomenon. Okay, so if you just took a transistor, and let's say you had some VGS on there, and then you have some VDS over here. Okay, and then I'm just going to plot the IV characteristic for that. So I've got some ID and some VDS. You know, for so for some region of time, you kind of get the standard thing that you're used to. But at some voltage, 
you're going to see something that actually starts doing this. Okay? At some magic voltage, the output, the drain current is actually going to start going up exponentially. Okay? So what's basically happening here is, you know, remember if I look at that device right there, and now I'm just going to draw the drain junction just because, you know, I'm tired of drawing the same MOSFET five times. So if I just draw the drain junction over there, right, remember I've basically got a diode, right? Well, diodes can break down. There's a maximum voltage that diodes can handle before just stuff starts going wrong. If you're a physicist, the, you know, the physical explanation there is, you know, if you have enough field across there, some of the electrons can actually hop over the barrier, and they pick up so much energy that they actually hit other electrons, you know, buried inside of the lattice, and they refree those, and you start getting what's called sort of avalanche breakdown. Because every electron starts knocking off a bunch of other electrons, and you just get more and more current flowing through there. Okay? So basically what's going to happen is if you put a high enough voltage onto your MOSFET, you're just going to break that junction down, and all of a sudden you're going to get lots and lots of drain current flowing. Okay? Now you do have to be careful about one thing, which is that drain current is actually flowing through the drain and into the body. Okay? It's not flowing through the source. It's actually flowing into the body. Because again, it's just that diode there is essentially breaking down. Okay? Now, this tends to happen at reasonably high voltages. So in a modern process where you've, let's say, you know, you're only supposed to be putting, let's say, about 1.2 volts across the transistor, or maybe a volt, you probably won't see this happen. But if you tried to be aggressive and actually put a pretty high drain voltage on there, which again, for analog, you might actually want to do, that's when you might start seeing these kinds of things come into the picture. So again, it's important to know about because you want to make sure that if you're going to be operating anywhere near there, your model better actually include this effect. Okay? Because as you can imagine, if I'm actually sort of anywhere close to here, my output resistance is basically going to suck. right? Because I'm right on the edge of just breaking that junction down, which obviously means I get a whole bunch more current for a very small change in drain voltage. Okay? Now, I've given you some sort of let's say, empirical equation over here. Uh, it's not super critical. It really just says, look, if you go beyond a certain voltage, the thing starts exponentially increasing in current. Again, I'm covering this really more so that you have an idea of what to look for. Okay. So now we've sort of covered largely the three main mechanisms. Now we can actually try and take a look and say, OK, well, so what is going to happen to my output resistance as a function of VDS? You know, what's that going to look like? And so what you can see is that, unfortunately, you know, unlike before where, let's say, in 140, you said something like, OK, R0 is equal to, well, actually, you guys tell me. What did you guys think R0 was in 140? Or what did we tell you R0 was in 140? 1 over lambda ID. Yeah, that was supposed to be 1 over lambda ID, right? So if I was to do a plot of R0 versus VDS, in our 140 model, it would have looked something like, and you know, not exactly, but something like, let's say, this, right? Where this would have been 1 over lambda ID, right? Too bad. Life's not that easy, right? In fact, what you've actually got is channel length modulation, Dibble, SCB, and a whole bunch of other things that I didn't even bother to mention. They're all happening at the same time. Right? So in fact, even quoting like a single R0 is clearly kind of a difficult thing to do at this point. Right? Because uh, I don't know. What is R0? Am I sitting here? Am I sitting there? Am I sitting over there? I don't know. Right? And in fact, even if I move slightly, I'm going to get a different answer. Right? So the only other thing that's kind of maybe useful to, to know is that typically for sort of so-called low fields, so meaning voltage is close to where the transistor is actually going in the saturation. Usually channel length modulation is what's important there. Once you get beyond that, then typically drain-induced barrier lowering is kind of the, the critical thing that happens. And then again, obviously, if you push the transistor too far, then you start breaking the junction down, and basically everything goes to hell. Okay, so 
most of the time, or you know, if, if I was you, you want to try and stay over there, right? Because at least there is now only kind of two effects that are coming into the picture. That's still complicated, but at least you don't have to worry about you know anything breaking in some way. Okay. This makes sense to everybody here. What kind of process was this from? Like, one point? I believe this was from a 0.35 micron process. Uh, also, a sort of fake process. So, you know, the nominal voltage there was, I believe, about 3.3 .3 volts or so. <coughs> so, you know, here you can see this is maybe a little bit aggressive because, you know, they were targeting that junction breakdown like right at the process voltage. But again, there, there's some cases where you may be tempted, even with a short channel device to actually put a pretty high voltage on its drain. Okay, usually what prevents you from doing that is actually that you don't want to break down the gate oxide. But let's say you had always one volt there, and let's say always ground there. You might be tempted to put two volts onto that side. right? From an oxide standpoint, it's still actually OK. But what might get you then is, indeed, the drain junction. Other questions? Or? Yeah? That um, SCB is exponentially um, uh, proportional to the inverse of the uh, drain length? Uh, yeah. Well, so yeah, I have to look at the sign of what I used there, but yes. Uh, yeah, so basically. That's an L is what. Sorry, say that again? That's an L is what I'm asking in the equation. The L over here, you mean? Yeah. It's that drain length. Oh, this L, no, I think this is just another fitting parameter, basically. Um, I don't think this, I don't remember what this one actually is. Again, this is a totally empirical expression. Um, so don't worry too much about it, because. You know, if you really need to be operating there, you better go and talk to your device buddies and see, OK, what exactly is going to be happening here? Uh, but actually, in some sense, the take-home message should be, don't be anywhere close to this, because it's really painful, and you know, there's probably not a great reason to do it. But yeah, if you really want to model it, you know, this is kind of some rough empirical model you can use. OK, so unless there's other sort of questions on that, the, the last thing I wanted to just sort of briefly mention is, well, Said all this, there's all this complicated stuff. It's going to be a pain for us to model by hand, so you know somebody has to do something. Well, okay, there is so-called BSIM, which is basically what you use in Spice. And by the way, BSIM, in case you didn't know, stands for Berkeley Short Channel Insulated Gate FET Model. Okay, um, they've actually moved to a slightly different version now, but for a long time this was really the industry standard model. Okay, and Probably the latest one that was kind of you know widely used was the so-called BSIM3 V3. Okay, and we're actually using that in this course as well. The bad news is here that again there's lots and lots of parameters embedded in that model. Okay, and so it takes a lot of actually expertise to, to kind of get even even if you have a device that you've measured, creating that model is actually a pretty involved process. So from the standpoint of us doing design, it would be really nice if we could somehow, you know, maybe not be BSIM, but get some hand calculation model. Okay. So it turns out there's been lots and lots of people that have tried to come up with so-called good hand models that would really work very, very nicely for analog design. And in fact, for those of you who maybe took 142 last semester, you know, when Ali, Professor Ali Nikanjad was here as a graduate student. The first project he worked on was exactly trying to come up with a so-called BSIM hand model. Okay? So in order to do this, this is, you know, the model is, I think, one of the things that he worked on among many other people. Uh, obviously, he graduated doing something else eventually, so you, know, you may expect what the result will be later. But in order to do that, you have to make all kinds of approximations. But let's say that you make some of these approximations. So you, you, know, you use our vertical field mobility degradation thing. You assume that's some linear thing. You include some velocity saturation effect. So you define some like critical field at which you hit that velocity saturation. You go and you do some integrals, and you come up with these sort of equations that actually, if you took 141, these are similar to the velocity saturation equations we used. Okay, So you can go through. You can do all that stuff. You can even take derivatives of those equations. Uh, I'm not particularly a big fan of these derivative equations, but you can do it. right? So you can get some kind of answers there. And in fact, if you looked at the so-called large signal behavior, meaning kind of the shapes of the curves, you can actually do a pretty good job. You can actually get things sort of pretty close to what SPICE tells you things should be. Okay, you have to do some work, again, to get all these parameters out of it. But 
actually that you can do a pretty reasonable job with. So who knows? What's the bad news? Why, why did I claim that actually you know, Ali didn't continue with this line of work? What's the bad news? Again, you're, you're analog designers, so what do you care about usually? Did I write those off? Yeah. You usually care about the small signal parameters, right? The small signal parameters, those are all related to the derivatives. Well, if you take a look at those derivatives, unfortunately, those are basically bogus. Okay, Because in order to get that right, you really have to include all these really, really detailed effects. And by the time you've done that, there's like, you know, 30 other parameters in these equations over here, and then it's just, there's no point, right? So, you know, you can stare at these curves a little bit more if you'd like to, but, you know, bottom line, you can kind of get maybe the, the overall, you know, shape of the IV characteristics roughly right, but the derivatives basically are really hard to actually get right, especially if you want to work in these regions where, let's say, like moderate inversion, where even this model that we've come up with is just completely bunk. Right, it just it completely ignores that region. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's an excellent question. BSIM would be the reference point you use. So, in theory, BSIM should be like close to the transistors, right. and you know usually it's reasonably good. But yeah, I mean, obviously you'd really want to measure this against a so-called actual transistor. But from that standpoint, you know, I, I could indeed get a BSIM model to at least fit one particular transistor really, really, really well, right? And so, yeah, then that would be kind of your sort of reference point against which to say, is this good or is this bad, right? And by the way, I mean, in some sense, kind of the qualitative behavior here of just below some certain region, you just don't even have a derivative anymore, whereas in reality, you know, there's some stuff happening there. That's really kind of the issue, right? Because even if I got, you know, maybe this region of the curve right, just qualitatively, there's things that are completely missing here. Uh, what does full mean? In the, so there's a curve that says full. Where are you looking? F-U-L-L. Full. Yeah. F-U-L. Oh, full. it just means full vSIM3 model. Oh. So these two curves right here are the complete <clears throat> vSIM3 model. And these two lines right here are the so-called hand vSIM model. So that, that's what that means. Sorry, just not 100% not clear. Does that make more sense now? OK, great. So bottom line point here is just that you know, even if we try and come up with this relatively simple hand model, it's really not convenient. A, because the equations of all the derivatives are garbage. Or I should say, not only are they wrong, but they're, they're a pain in the ass to deal with. right? And it doesn't include all these sort of important effects that we're going to need to know about. So we can't really use that. But again, we really need some sort of model to build up intuition into what our circuits are going to do. Okay. So the interesting observation I'm going to make here, or maybe the claim I'm going to make, is that actually, for design, a lot of what these models tell you the answer to is probably not what you really cared about. Okay. So these models would really tell you something like, how do I choose width and length? But as a designer, you probably actually care about other things. And we'll talk about what those are in one second. So the claim I'm going to make, which we're going to start on now, is I claim we can actually do very, very effective designs without ever really using the model, except as a lookup table for what is the actual transistor width and length I need to use. Okay. So in order to see how we do that, let's go ahead and move into the uh, next set of lecture notes here. OK. So again, what we're going to be starting to do now is looking at how can we come up with small signal MOSFET models that we're going to use for design. OK? And so I kind of basically already went over this, so I'm going to kind of skip this. So what I'm going to talk about now, or maybe we'll talk about together, is what is it that you as a designer actually care about? OK? So. If you were doing the actual layout for the transistors, or for the circuit, I should say, from a layout standpoint, usually all you care about is the width and the length, right? Because that kind of sets everything else. But as a designer, again, I would claim that width and length are totally secondary parameters, OK? Because what you usually care about is things about the actual circuit, right? 
You care about things like how much gain am I going to get or how much transconductance am I going to get and how does that relate to the output resistance, right? You care about things like how much bandwidth am I going to get, right? Which obviously is going to be related to your GM, your capacitors, and so on. You also probably care about how much power I'm going to be dissipating, right? Or how much voltage swing I can use in my amplifier before all kinds of nasty stuff happens, right? But notice, even though these are all related to width and length, width and length are really not the things that you care about, right? They're sort of just, they should sort of just pop out of you figuring out what you do actually want, right? So again, what I'm going to show you here is how do we come up with a design methodology to basically focus on the circuit design parameters we care about and then just use SPICE, or really the BSIM model, as a lookup table to get us back to what the actual transistors are supposed to be, OK? So in order to do that, there's sort of one thing that I need to maybe remind you about, which is, you know, again, if you're doing analog design, what you care about is the small signal parameters. In some sense, the model for those never really changes, right? Because no matter what your drain current model is, the GM is always just DID DVGS, right? The RO, or really the GDS, or GO, is always just DID DVDS, right? So the whole name of the game in terms of small signal models is just figuring out what those coefficients actually are, right? So what you're really doing as a designer is basically figuring out, OK, what are those coefficients? And what should I choose them to actually be for my particular circuit, OK? So let's take a look at you know, what might be sort of important from that standpoint. So let's just take a transistor. And this is, by the way, actually, no, this is, I think this is in a 0.18 micron process. Okay. Let's just take a transistor, and in the different process corners, let's look at what the output resistance is. Okay. And by the way, these two plots are exactly identical. One's just on a log scale, one's on a linear scale. Okay. So again, as we just talked about, this is kind of hopeless to model with a simple equation. right? Hard to really say exactly what's going to be going on here. It's certainly not 1 over lambda ID. Okay. So that's the bad news. The good news is that actually, in some sense, there's a pretty easy way for me to deal with this. Okay? There's a pretty easy way for me to just sort of specify what I really care about and then get all the information I need. So let's see how we do that. Okay? The first point is that, again, as an analog designer, sometimes you really do care about RO. But most of the time, what you actually care about is not RO, but rather how much gain can you get out of the transistor. How much open loop gain can you get? In other words, what's GM RO? Okay. So if that's what I really care about, what I should really be doing is figuring out how am I going to measure that open loop gain? And how am I going to come up with sort of some specifications or really some lookup tables that I can use to figure out what is the gain I can actually achieve? Okay. So by the way, to do that, I often use this circuit that I've shown here. And I'm just going to walk through the circuit really briefly, just because you know, it'll probably be useful for you as an example on your homework. So and I'm not only on the homework, obviously, but you know, in the future to generate these kind of tables. So let's just sort of take a look at how would I go about measuring this AV naught. Okay? As an example, what I might do is I would say, basically just use some bias current from this, for this transistor. And of course, I can change that bias current around. right? So I use that bias current. And then rather than just sort of diode connecting the device, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie it into this feedback loop through this op amp over here. Okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because I want sort of two things to happen. So I want to make sure the device, yeah, certainly I want to put it sort of into saturation or close to that. But I also want to be able to see what happens to my gain as I move that drain voltage around, right? Because as you'll see in a second, the gain I can get is also directly related to how much voltage swing I want to tolerate, right? 
in order to do that measurement, what I'm going to do is I put this op amp into here. That's going to set this VGS to be whatever it needs to be to set the drain voltage to whatever I put on the reference over here. right? And so by doing this, I can basically take a measurement, which is very similar to what a real amplifier would be doing, where I can say, OK, what's the small signal gain I get from that transistor as a function of the voltage that I put onto its drain, Okay, obviously given this particular bias current here. right? Now, there's one other thing that I should note here, especially if you yourself are going to use this. You know, a lot of times when you see the symbol, you're really tempted to just put a gain of infinity right there, or some really, really large number. And as you can see on the slide, I claim that you want to actually put a gain maybe only of about 100 or something like that. So why did I make that claim? What's, what's you know, the simulation thing that tends to go wrong when you put really, really high gain in there? The precision of the this thing? Say that again? This is the precision of the computer. Ah, OK. You're kind of going the right direction. So you said something about the precision of the computer. Um, that's right. But so what's the, you know, what is that from a very practical standpoint? You know, you go, you plug this circuit in, you put a really ridiculously high gain in there. What do you get annoyed about? What happens that bugs you? Convergence, DC point. <coughs> yeah, OK. Well, so convergence, basically to say it another way. Oscillation. It, well, that could happen, although usually you know, that, that's probably OK. Um, what basically happens is you sit there and you wait for a long freaking time, right? Because the darn thing can't figure out you know, down to the last nanovolt exactly where the gate of voltage is supposed to be, right? Which, of course, is related to the numerical precision and et cetera. But bottom line, it just takes a really long time to converge, right? So that's why you, know, you use something, let's say, reasonable over there, right? Where I just decided 100 is about reasonable. But you don't want to make it too large, because obviously if you make it too big, just you sort of sit there and wait for a really long time. Now, if you had a circuit that you, know, you really needed to know exactly that VDS was you know, 1.011111 volts, then sure, you have to use higher gain. But you know, for a lot of the plots we're going to be talking about, that's really not the purpose. Okay? Because again, what we're really interested in is these curves that look like this. Okay, that are going to tell us, OK, if I measure that small signal gain, which again is just going to be GMRO, how does that vary as I move the VDS around? Okay. So actually, from now on, what I claim we're going to be doing in terms of the so-called lookup table, since it's clear that there's a big trade-off between how much gain we can get and which voltage we're actually operating at, the way we should really treat this is just to say, OK, if I'm going to be building my amplifier, there's kind of two things that I need to know. First is, let's say, how much voltage swing do I want to get out of this amplifier? right? So in this particular case, let's say I just decided I want to make sure that I have a voltage swing of at least, let's say, 0.6 volts up to 1.2 volts. Okay. So if I do that, then now I know that, OK, at least, you know, basically, obviously, it varies across the corners, but not hugely. Once I've specified that voltage swing, I now basically know, OK, what's the maximum gain I can actually get? Or what's the, I should say, really, the minimum gain that I can guarantee across that entire voltage swing, right? Because basically, you know, you can see, sure, the gain actually goes up as I increase the VDS over there. But if I specify that, OK, this is the voltage range I'm interested in, then I can safely say, OK, my transistor is going to give me a gain of at least, I think it's about 25 or 26, right? Now, obviously, if you change the voltage range you're interested in, the gain you can guarantee is going to get, is going to change, right? So in particular, let's actually sort of take an example. Let's say that I'm going to increase my voltage range. What's going to happen to the gain you can guarantee? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Yeah, it's going to go down, right? So if I increase the voltage range, I basically have to move these you know, two markers out to the side over there. And let's say it really is like that. And then now, unfortunately, that's the gain I can actually guarantee. Okay. In fact, I'd claim that 
if you just have this plot for a bunch of different devices at different bias points and different channel lengths, right? And as we'll see in a second, what you can do is, when you're specifying your amplifier or really designing your amplifier, you'd go in and you'd say, okay, I want a voltage swing of X with a gain of at least, let's say, 20 or whatever it is. And then you go, you just look in your lookup table and you'd see, okay, what's the minimum channel length device I need to actually get that much gain with that much voltage swing, okay? Now, I've kind of already sort of hinted at this, which again, I'm sure you guys all remember from 140. If you actually increase the channel length, the gain you can get actually goes up, okay? And that just has to do with you're sort of reducing some of the effects of these parasitic things like channel length modulation and drain-induced barrier lowering. You basically get better as you increase the channel length, okay? So from a design standpoint, you'd want to generate a bunch of these different curves with different channel lengths, and then use those to figure out which channel length should I actually use to hit a certain specification, okay? Now, I should mention one thing over here, which is there are other ways to increase your gain as well. In particular, what's one way you probably spent a lot of time on in 140 that would also increase your gain? That's like a really simple circuit trick you can play to get better gain out of Cascoding? Looking. Yeah, there we go, cascoding, right? So I can always take a device and add another device on top of it over <laughs> here with some bias voltage, of course. And if I do that, Let's say the gain of each one of those was AV naught. Roughly, how much gain would I get out of the cascode? GMR squared, or R naught squared. Yeah, so AV naught squared, right? So as it actually turns out, we're going to look at a little bit later. If you really look at the trade-off between how much voltage range you can get and how much gain you can get, in almost all situations, you'd actually rather use a cascode than a long channel device. Okay? So again, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. You'll see why that is. But you know, you may want to even generate these plots not just for different channel links, but in fact, go and build like a cascoded structure and see how much gain do you get as a function of that VDS over there. Okay? Is there a question? Yeah. Absolutely. You're obviously using some other frequency, right? Um, yes and no. So actually, I claim that in many situations, I can actually build a better transient response to the cascode than I can with a long-channel device. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. No, I didn't mean the cascode. But what I was asking was, like, uh, these plots are for the DC Oh, character. I see. Yes, absolutely. All the plots I'm talking about so far are for DC characteristics. We're going to talk some more about the AC characteristics in one second. And then, again, I'm actually going to claim we can really use SPICE as a lookup table to answer a lot of those questions. But you're absolutely right. So far, I'm just talking about DC. Okay, but even that we're going to see is actually quite useful. Yeah. Voltage swing, though. Ah, so that's actually you know. So you're right, or people like to think of it that way. But we're going to see a little bit later on that actually, even if I had a cascode like this, if I looked at the gain I could get as a function of that VDS. We're going to see it's actually basically going to be just as good as what you could have gotten from a long channel device. Okay, so if you don't believe me now, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, so this is, I'm just sort of mentioning this now so that it's in the back of your head and when we come back to it in like a couple of weeks, you'll say, oh, okay, now I understand what's going on. Okay? Other questions? Okay, good. So now there's one sort of interesting thing, which again is one of these really big complaints that analog guys like to make, guys and girls I should say, which is, oh okay, I'm going to scale from let's say 0.35 or 0.5 micron down to 0.18 micron and my, my GMRO just keeps getting crappier and crappier and crappier. In other words, the output resistance just gets really bad, right? And so. And by the way, that complaint is indeed true. If you looked at sort of the like peak GMRO you can actually get from a given technology at any VDS, it is indeed the case that those short channel devices get worse. Okay? Now, why do I claim that maybe sometimes people are just complaining a lot, but not quite for a great reason? 
and maybe ask it a different way. So we're looking here at peak gain, right? How many circuits have you built that had 1.4 volts across your key, your gain device? Or 1.2 or anything like that. Anybody ever built a circuit like that? OK, what do you usually have across your gain device? How much voltage? Just the ballpark. 500 millivolts. OK, 500 millivolts. Any other? Uh, that's, that's reasonable. Any other uh, thoughts? 250 millivolts. 250 millivolts. By the way, what are those numbers kind of related to? The VD sat. Yeah, they're related to kind of the VD sat. Right now, of course, VD sat is only related to short, uh, long channel devices, but we'll come back to that one second. But Basically, if you want to build a good amplifier, you want to make sure you can actually get gain and swing, right? If you want to get a lot of swing, you ain't <coughs> going to have a ton of voltage just statically across that device, right? Because you're just wasting voltage headroom. So in fact, if you look at you know, what quote unquote really happens, if you look at the gain at sort of more reasonable VDS, or I should say kind of the practical VDSs you're probably going to be using, the short channel devices aren't all that bad. Okay, I mean, don't get me wrong, they do suck, but they don't suck anywhere near as badly as people complain about. Okay? And in particular, you know, you're never gonna get devices that don't have gain because then it's it doesn't even work for digital. So don't worry about that. Okay, you know, it'll be small, but you'll still get, you know, some reasonable amount of gain. Let's say five to ten, even for really aggressive devices. Okay? At least for again the sort of reasonable voltages that you're probably going to be using. So we kind of have an idea of how to deal with R0, or really with the voltage gain, which is what R0 is kind of most important for. So what I want to start talking about now is how we're going to deal with transconductance. Okay. And so for transconductance, I again want to just you know sort of start out with the square law model, not because that's actually going to be the model we use. But just to sort of remind you of a couple of important things, OK? So if I take that square law model and I just do the derivatives, there's a couple of sort of, or really there's one really famous form for GM that you want to remember. Because we're going to be actually using this quite a bit, just with a slight tweak, OK? So if you go through all that stuff, at the end of the day, you can pretty quickly show that the GM is just related to 2 times the drain current divided by the so-called overdrive, or VD sat, as sometimes people call it, right? Which is just VGS minus VT, OK? So why is it that I claim this is actually a pretty useful way of looking at things? In other words, if I looked at this thing, you know, I, I can see that there's this trade-off, right? I can see that for a lower VD sat, or a lower VOD, I'm going to get more GM, right? So that's, that's good. What else do I know about VOD from a sort of circuit standpoint? What does it tell me about in terms of if I change that, how it changes my circuit design? What else comes into the picture there? Bias current. OK, that's kind of what we were saying. So there's something about the bias current here. Actually, we're going to follow up on that in one second. right? So this VOD is kind of telling you something about if I want a certain GM, how much bias current I need? That's definitely true, right? So we'll come back to that one. Swing. What else does the thing tell you about? Swing. Yeah, it kind of tells you about the swing, right? Because if I have a big VGS minus VTH, then probably I can't use too low of a drain voltage, right? So I also actually want to use sort of a small VDS, or excuse me, VDSAT or VOD to get a lot of swing out of my device. What else comes into the picture from that standpoint? The amount of GM that you can get for an overdrive? Uh, amount of GM you can get for a unit bias current. Yeah, I think we, I think we covered that already. Anything else comes into the picture? I'll give you a hint. Shiva asked about it. So what else matters? Bandwidth? Yeah. Right? If I have a really small VD sat, I'm going to have to use a really big transistor to get that transconductance. Right? And that basically means I'm going to have a lot of parasitic cap. Right? You can see just that one parameter right there 
kind of tells you about the trade-offs between maybe not everything, but almost everything you care about, right? So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to claim that what we should really be doing is basically using that as kind of a, uh, right now I'm going to call it a figure of merit, but it's kind of actually a metric that we're going to use to drive our design, OK? So to see how we're going to do that, let's, you know, let's again just look at what VDSAT implies or VOD implies about this so-called GM over ID, OK? So as we were talking about a second ago, you know, if I want to build, let's say, a really high gain bandwidth amplifier, what I want is a lot of GM, right? But I don't want to pay any power for that GM. So what would be interesting for me to look at from the device standpoint is how much GM do I get per unit bias current that I'm willing to spend, right? Because the more GM I get for bias current, the lower power I can use for the same bandwidth, right? OK, so in fact, if you look at you know exactly what we did here one second ago, and you just flip VOD to one side and GM to the other, you can immediately see that GM over ID, at least for that square law device, is just 2 over VDSAT, or 2 over VOD, right? So just like we just said, if I make VOD smaller, great, I get higher GM over ID, right? I get a more efficient circuit, OK? Now again, that's purely a DC metric, so we're going to come back to look later at you know, how we deal with the capacitance. But there's one other sort of interesting thing here. So if I looked at this equation, it would seem to imply that I could make VOD 0 and get infinite GM over ID, right? But clearly, this is a plot of a real device, by the way. This real device, it actually rolls off over here, right? So why did that happen? What is this? What is that right there? Current is exponential with VG. There we go. Right? So even if I make VGS 0, I'm basically in subthreshold now, right? Once I'm in subthreshold, there's a very direct relationship between how much I move that VGS, how much change in current I get, and how much bias current I had. So in fact, if you look at it, when you're working in the so-called weak inversion region, since we basically have a bipolar transistor, the relationship between GM and ID is the same as the relationship you get from a bipolar transistor. Okay, and nicely enough, since it's an exponential thing, when you take the derivative, you just get back another exponential, just with a scale factor, right? And so if you just you know sort of manipulate these things a little bit. What you basically come up with is that the GM for the device, even for a MOSFET, just turns out to be the drain current divided by n kT over q. By the way, that kT over q, that's the thermal voltage. Uh, I'll sometimes refer to that as VT, not to be confused with VTH, even though I sometimes say VTH or sometimes say VT and mean the threshold. Uh, hopefully, based on the context, it'll be clear. But bottom line, this number over here, that kT over q, typically it's like 25 millivolts. Okay. So if that number is 25 millivolts and this n was, let's say, 1.3, you can very quickly calculate what's the biggest GM over ID you can actually get, right? If you take a look right there, that's you know this number of like 27, 28, pretty common number. Okay, probably what you can expect from a you know, modern process. So just to maybe like briefly wrap up before we go for today, if we look at this GM over ID, and we're going to see in one second, I'm going to claim this is going to be a really useful design parameter. I can actually use that to get a lot of intuition to what's happening from a, at least current efficiency standpoint, right? Because again, if I had a MOSFET and I was operating it in strong inversion, and I would get something like the GM is 2 ID over VDSAT. Whereas if I push that down into the bipolar region, what I should get is something like ID over the thermal voltage. Okay. So by the way, just in case you're curious about why people say BJTs are so much better than MOSFETs, it just has to do with this relationship here. Okay. Because for a MOSFET to be inverted 
you need to have a big VDSAT. Okay? If I have a big VDSAT, that means my transconductance efficiency is worse than what I could have gotten from the BJT. Okay? Of course, if you push the MOSFET closer to the BJT region, now you can at least get close to what the BJT was able to do, except that unfortunately you have that n factor right there. Okay? So if you ever see, by the way, a curve that has you know, this GM over ID of something that's better than 40, and by the way, just in case you're curious, the units of this are a little bit funny. They're inverse volts. No, don't worry about that. It's just this number that really matters. If you ever have a MOSFET and you see something with a GM over ID better than 40 inverse volts, you should immediately you know, go barf on whoever gave you the model. right? Because it's just it's bogus. Okay? It better not be any higher than like, I don't know, 40 over about 1.3 or so. Okay? So I think we'll wrap up with that for today. And next time we'll see how are we going to use all this stuff from a design standpoint. So see you guys on Tuesday.